Hello and welcome to another couple of hours of waffle. Um, so we're going to talk about these um, sort of classic Hollywood glamour pictures today. Um, so these are the most recent ones that I've done uh, with Rain Swan and uh, Melanie Doyle did the makeup uh, for these which is fantastic. She's really nailed the look. We've got a matte base, big eyebrows, dark red lips, um, very nice sort of side bun thing going on. Um, all works very well. Um, so a lot of people have been asking, um, what does what's the light look like? You know, what's the post processing? Um, but mainly, what's the light look like? So I think we're going to start with that, and um, I'll show you some pictures of um, uh, what the studio looks like, and uh, and what we use in in terms of lights. So let's start off with um, here's a little pano. This is not the same shoot, obviously. Um, obviously the the model is different. Uh, so this is my friend and business partner Joe, um, and this was originally when we were fiddling around and and trying to sort of crack this this style um, before we um, sort of let it loose on um, uh, paying customers. Um, and in this, you can see um, we've got an all incandescent setup for the for the main lights here. Um, and this because this was a while ago. I've now replaced the key light with an LED, which we'll come back to in a minute. But for the time being, we've got three 650 watt tungsten spots uh, they've got fresnels in uh, they're very simple it's just basically they're a bulb holder they're, they're a copy of some sort of ARRI uh, light and they, they've even gone to the the trouble of building this little box on the bottom which is empty in these lights it would have contained the power supply or something or other um, in there um, but, but it's empty in these but the, the uh, Chinese manufacturers have still copied it um, on the back here you can see there's a, a little focusing knob and what that does is it moves the reflector and the bulb backwards and forwards in here um, and uh, once it's right up the front against the Fresnel it's on full flood um, but it's also giving the hardest light um, because the element is, is the light there it's just really really small when you back it off then the reflected light from the bulb fills the Fresnel at the front um, and uh, it, it's, it narrows the beam down um, and unlike a grid, it is actually taking all of the light and putting it into a small space, so it becomes more intense, whereas a grid just blocks off some of the, the unwanted light and absorbs it. Um, this actually does make it more efficient over a narrower space, same amount of light in a narrower space. Um, what it also does, though, is, of course, it now means that the, the light source is now the size of the front element, the, the glass on the front of the spotlight, so it's a little bit softer. Uh, and we can use that in lots of creative ways, as, as we'll see uh, as we go through the shoot, to sort of soften the edges of, um, of things across this shadow transition here. Um, you know, we can play around with that by zooming and moving the barn doors. So they do have barn doors on. Um, and because this is such a small element, the barn doors actually do work. Um, barn doors on studio heads, because the flash bulbs are huge, right? I mean, they're, they're about that diameter, aren't they? Um, because the barn doors are really close, they just provide a sort of a gradient more than anything. They don't really provide an edge. In order to do this same stuff with um, studio lights, you'd really need flags that are further away from the light um, so that you can get more of an edge. And you just need a lot more space all round uh, to do it with flash. It is possible, but um, I just find it a lot easier for many, many reasons um, to use these old lights. Now, this, this is the current key light that I use. It's um, a Falconize 1600 TDX. Um, it's so named because it's supposed to have the same light output as a 1600 watt incandescent. But my light meter says no, um, that, that isn't the case. It's about the same um, as one of these um, spots, maybe a little bit dimmer actually. Um, but it does have several advantages and I've got another picture of it here somewhere. There it is from the front. There we go. So it does have a few advantages. Um, it's LED, so it doesn't get anywhere near as hot as these. So it doesn't. You can hold it. You can move it with your hands during the shoot. Uh, as I have to wear gloves to move these. Um, and um, it doesn't make, melt the makeup off the model, you know, and, and make them sort of um, wilt during the studio as much. Um, and because it's uh, LED, it doesn't vary the temperature of the light when you turn it up and down. With these, when you turn them down, the light gets more orange. Um, till you know, when you turn them down all the way, it's like a looking into um, 
an electric fire. It is actually orange, the light coming out of it. Whereas these, at the same color temperature uh, across the um, luminosity range, you can turn it up and down, it won't alter. But if you do need it to match these, this light does go from something like about 2,700 Kelvin all the way up to 7,000 Kelvin, um, which is very, very useful. You can match daylight, you can match um, these tungsten lights and, and anything in between. Also, because they are um, uh, LEDs and not particularly useful for this shoot, but this is something else that I do use them for, is to attach these uh, breakup gels, these scatter gels. Um, this Damien Lovegrove makes these. Um, you can get them from his shop. Um, and he sells some rather nice and right, very expensive LED lights, <clears throat> um, a bit beyond my price range for the amount of time that I use them. But the, these are really useful in um, uh, location shoots indoors. You know, aiming them at blank backgrounds and things like you can see here. Yeah, great. You know, I could do that in post, really. Um, but it's amazing just how magic this this light is as a key light uh, when you just throw it on. Um, it's attached to the barn doors. Um, and I just use these uh, C74s, uh, as they call them, which are kind of like reversed C47s, um, apparently so called because they came in packs of 47. That doesn't sound right to me. I mean, these came from Sainsbury's in packs of 50, and uh, you basically just reverse them. Um, they're very good then for clipping onto um, flat surfaces and all kinds of things like the rims of reflectors and stuff. Um, although I've moved on to using magnets and clips and stuff that holding stuff onto reflectors. Um, these are, are very useful. These barn doors are made of aluminium, so magnets don't stick to them, um, which is a bit of a pain. Otherwise, I'd use magnets on this as well. Um, but we hold these on. You can't do this with an incandescent light for fairly obvious reasons. These things would just melt and catch fire and go up in flames uh, within seconds uh, if you put one of these um, through them at full power. Um, I mean, you literally cannot hold the case or anything, the barn doors or anything on this once they've been going for more than about five or ten minutes without taking the skin off your fingers. Uh, so I wear gloves or use a pair of pliers or something like that to move these things about. Um, so that's that's the main light. The, the big disadvantage of this main light is it weighs more than the moon. I mean, this thing is huge um, for, you know, what is, relatively speaking, quite a dim light, you know. Um, but... Um, it is on the whole better so we use it so that's that's the light i've got a few more pictures of um of stuff in the studio here so let's let's have a look um around there we go so there's what it looks like from the front um you can see here we've got the um the key light um for, for a lot of the shots i'm about to show you like this one here the key light is actually straight above it's about here rather than off to the side but when we generally over the course of a shoot we'll be moving this around um, uh, and uh, fiddling around with the depending on the pose sometimes I want the pose the light direction to match where the subject is looking a lot of the time so we move the light to match the pose um, edge lights you can see the barn doors are really really closed down because we're in a small studio and um, if we didn't have those barn doors um, yes they would still light the edge of the model um, but they'd also light everything else right, and just destroy uh, the, the mood that we're trying to create, the contrast that we're trying to create. So we have those all closed down. In fact, the key lights really closed down as well. So you can see in total here, we've got you know, 650 times three um, lots of, of light in the room and yet it's dark, right? I mean, that, that's, and that's purely because of all these barn doors and, and focusing arrangements. Um, down here, we have the uh, fill card uh, which is just some phone call, A1, A0, something like that, um, phone call, uh, which you just get from sort of art and craft shops in packs of 10. Um, and they're really, really useful. But the key light doesn't really give enough uh, light on there um, to provide enough um, fill. So what we have here, what we have here is um, an LED panel light. It's just a, a cheap Filtrox 116. Again, it's color adjustable. I really like these. They're about 30 quid, something like 40, 50 dollars, something like that. And they take um, Sony NPF style clip on batteries, or they have a 12 volt jack on the back. And again, the color adjustable, temperature adjustable, and then the LEDs are around the edge uh, with a diffusion panel. Um, and they're really, really useful. Um, let me see if I, there's a better picture you can see it on there. And that just chucks a bit more fill into the uh, fill card. Now, the other thing 
characteristic about this light is that the key light is generally very high. We have it quite low here actually on this particular one, um, but certainly when we shot these we had the key light really really high and that's to get this kind of dramatic shadow off the eyelashes and you get some shadow under there and under the lip and all that kind of stuff going on. But one of the downsides of having that high key light is you don't really get catch lights in the eyes. Um, so to get a catch light in the eyes, we kind of just finesse and feather this um, uh, bounce light here, which is primary job is to bounce off this card. Um, I aim it slightly towards the model and that provides a key light. And in fact, I think we've, we've managed to actually get a key light, uh, sorry, um, a catch light. We've managed to get a catch light off the key light on this one, but we've also got that lower one. If you look there, you can see that little, that little one sneaking in. And so that's, that does double duty. Now on this particular one, we were using this light blaster here uh, to provide the background. Um, I can't quite remember what it was, to be honest. Um, you know, but, um, Venetian blinds or a little cross window or something like that. Um, I also use cookies, big pieces of cardboard, um, which we shine one of these lights through. Um, but now that I've got four, including that LED, we typically use one of these on the background. You can see in this one, I've also been playing around with using um, either the modeling light um, off this studio head, this Lancata super fast, or perhaps the flash as well. Um, because I don't really need to finesse or move this too much, the background light, it's okay with it being flash. Obviously I can't see that uh, when we're shooting, um, but that's okay, right? So we can have the background on flash. We very re Once that's set up and I've centered it and it looks about the right sort of shape and size, we kind of leave it alone. Um, and it's, I uh, quite often put a blue gel in the backlight so that, um, because I noticed obviously it was bluer because it's flash. So I accentuated that with a blue gel and that allows me to control it independently on the color channel by turning the blue luminosity up and down in post. So if I think, oh, you know, background light's a bit hot, we've got that on a slider and we can control it, which is useful, but, um, not essential, it's just something I did by accident and it was useful a couple of times. But um, generally, we're using continuous light like this because um, the light has to be placed very, very precisely to get this, this look right. Okay, so on these shots here, we've got a strip of light going up and down the model's face from above, and we're using the barn doors to create this. Uh, and then we use the focusing spot. So I spot the light up a bit to soften the edges. And then we move the barn doors in and out and we move the light in and out and we move the light left and right and so on. And also with the uh, edge lights here, we don't, I often don't want them all the way down here, just on the shoulders and on the top of the, uh, the head here. Um, and so it's great to be able to see what you're doing. Now, if we used flash, it would be very, very difficult. Um, and Rain did a fantastic job. I think she's possibly been uh, the best subject I've had for this so far at sitting still, right? Um, because once you've adopted the pose, I need to dial the light in to match it. And uh, if the model moves uh, while you're doing that, it can create some real issues. You have to kind of start again. Um, so using continuous lights, really, to me, the best way to go if you can. You can do this with flash. I've done it with speed lights. They are very small elements, so it's actually quite they quite they create a very similar light um, because the element the front of the speed light is very small, um, so you, you can use them at similar distances. And I've done this, you know, demos for camera clubs and things like that because they typically most people have got a few flashlights, but not a lot of people have got these sort of lights knocking around. Um, Robert Harrington, by the way, he he um, I got the idea to do speed lights by watching his video at B and H. So um, go and search that out, Robert Harrington. Um, at B and H, um, if you search for Robert Harrington, B and H, um, Hollywood glamour, that kind of thing, um, you'll find it. It's a really good video, and he does a little demo using speed lights, uh, and and gets very close to this kind of setup. So um, we'll just have a look at um, in um, Satellite here. So this is Satellite 3D, um, which is um, a lighting modeling software, and I highly recommend this. Um, it's about £100, something like that, about $150, $120, something like that. 
and it's it's got most types of lights and but for some reason there are a six fifty s do not have bond or zone i don't know why because they do have the little attachments at the front to put the barn doors on where that where that barn door arrangement sort of slots into there and then this one swings around and clips onto it but they haven't got the actual barn doors um which means i can get sort of close and i've made the this everything dark in the studio to try and get it um close um and that's what we get it's 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 not not too bad um and i created this in retrospect i didn't really use this to um, to plan this one but typically for um playing around with gels and um lights and stuff like that i mean you've got you know, um, you've got all these different types of lights. So those are the, the perma lights. You've got um, speed lights with various adapters and the light blaster. You can actually do um, uh, projecting various shapes now. Um, and they've also got a, a gobo projector for the bigger lights. <laughs> they've, got, they've got a ring flash, just especially for you, Neil. Um, and uh, that I, I don't possess a ring flash, so, so I never use that. Um, and I want these usual reflectors and um, uh, soft boxes, um, uh, umbrellas and strip boxes and all kinds of things. So you can just drag these onto your set and, uh, and play around with it. So I really like this software. Everything can be gelled. Um, you can defocus and focus these things. Um, they're, they're really, really useful. Um, uh, and there's a variety of models, um, male and female, different skin colors, ages. Um, pretty good. So. Um, this is as close as I could get, but you know, I, we, we can see there's a spot at the back um, and we've got the two edge lights. Sometimes I have a third edge light up there and sometimes just one up there. It depends on, on the, the shoot. Sometimes I just prefer the hair light from the top, but you know, there's all kinds of things you can do. Right. So, um, so after, after all of that, um, we got round to um, getting these shots and uh, so we're going to retouch another one now um so i've been through the um uh, the stuff that we shot and um i'm looking at this one and uh, i think this this was um a bit of a test to be honest i think um she was laughing about something or other and um we got this really really natural smile as she kind of calmed down after laughing hysterically at something or other uh, probably one of my uh, terrible jokes maybe um, but um, we got this, but it, but it wasn't um, particularly lit. We didn't have the lights right for this, but she, she's not quite in the, the position we were going for. Um, so I'll show you um, how this looked um, out of camera, uh, but I really like the expression. Um, so what we've done is we've switched to, as all of these, I'm shooting these in, in developing them in camera portrait, which is a little bit flatter. Uh, and then we've brought the shadows up brought the exposure up a little bit and brought the highlights down, which is kind of like bringing the shadows up a bit more, right? But I maxed out on the shadows. So I raised the exposure, brought the highlights down, which means everything else has come up in effect. So the highlights have stayed um, and everything below the highlights has come up. Um, we've brought the, the whites up because it starts to look a little bit muddy um, with all of that uh, contrast taken out of it. Um, but brought them back down and then we've adjusted the black point again because you know that's drifted off its base um had a quick look in black and white yeah not convinced just yet it might it might work later um but then i decided i needed more shadows so what we've done is we've added a graduated filter over the whole thing and maxed out the shadows on that um yeah and that turned it up and then i decided not to have it on the bottom a little bit um turned it on and off to see what was going on, decided I need even more. So I duplicated that adjustment. Um, but there's a law of diminishing returns here. We needed more blacks um, because we've added more shadow, um, just not quite as much. And then I decided I needed to lift the shadows just on the um, uh, cheek here. So we added a little radial adjustment and uh, you, know, you can turn them on and off. And uh, added a little bit of exposure to that because adding shadows wasn't really doing very much. And also keep an eye on this little miniature. This is what I'm really watching when I look at this. It looks very flat on here, but look over here and you see that 
you know, as we go up and down this, you can see the, the adjustments there. And then I've knocked a little bit out of the shadows um, globally, um, but then changed my mind and put it back up. So overall, you can see that's where we started from and that's where we've come to. And if we look at the, the miniature, unfortunately that doesn't um, react to that. I just have to hover over that. Now I think that I've maybe gone a little bit too far there. So what I'm going to do is just take take those shadows back a bit and we'll go into that radial adjustment there. I'm going to knock um, that back a bit just to plus 0.1. Okay, now I'm quite happy with that. Um, so I think that's what we're going to go for. Um, and you can already see, I mean, it's it's pretty much done, right? I mean, there's there's not a lot to do. What we do in in post really in Photoshop is is more or less clean up. Um, but I'll go through it just because, um, so you can see uh, the some of the techniques that are used to to make that happen. So we're going to edit in Photoshop, and I'll wait for that to to lumber into life. Um, just uh, talk amongst yourselves a little bit um, while we're uh, Photoshop um, fires up and there we go um, there it is okay now I can immediately see here there's some funkiness gone on with the um, the top of the frame here but this is this is easily fixed this is the the order of business that I normally go on is is, is there anything I need to delete right or, or you know fiddle with um, and this is pretty easy one uh, I'm just going to draw a rectangular selection around that I'm going to use um, um, free transfer from holding the shift key because this is newer Photoshop and just the barest amount I can get away with a little bit more I'm just going to drag that up um, to get rid of that little widget at the top of the frame there okay that's more or less gone um, but I might just get Photoshop to kind of uh, reinvent the top of that so I'm just going to press uh, shift F5 content aware fill so make sure the fill type is content aware. Let Photoshop come up with its alternative interpretation of what those pixels should be. Um, have a look and uh, we can look on the history. Um, so it still had a little hint of a strange strip up the top there and now it's completely gone. We might actually just blur that a little bit later, but we'll, we'll see. Right, back to the layers. And the next task is what I do is normally just fix any sort of bumps and uh, lumps and bumps with the uh, liquify tool. There is very little to do on this image. There's nothing really um, that I, I really need to do. Um, I might just adjust the, the hair to make little curves rather than even out any little flat bits. And the trick to this tool, this is the forward warp tool, it's the top one is to have the brush about the same size as the thing you want to adjust right so i'm going to just tuck the shoulder down just a little bit there and obviously it's close to the face so i can't really be too um, um, boisterous about it um, and just lowering the shoulder just a little bit there just a tiny bit just a touch as glenn joseph would say now um, for smiley lips it's much more forgiving, really. Um, and you see, I'm making the brush smaller because I actually want to just bring out that little dint uh, in the lip line. And I'm just going to bring the, um, the lips just up a bit like that. And I'm going to just even out this down here, make them a little bit bigger, the brush a little bit bigger, and just tuck that in. All right, and we can see. On the preview that we've even that out don't go too far you don't want to create the joker right um that that would be bad um and that's that's pretty much it really for this i'm, I'm not going to do too much to that we might just just make the eyes just a little bit more prominent uh, and we really want to go for about no more than about eight or ten on that um and that's about it we can knock the preview on and off and you can see what we've done which is um not very much at all so wait for that to return to the main Photoshop display. And uh, the next thing we're going to do is the skin cleanup. So the primary tool for this is the spot cleaning brush for me. Um, I use a combination of this and the patch tool and various other things. Um, 
and we'll we'll set up a frequency separation construct in a minute to do some of the tone smoothing so that we can preserve the uh, texture but for now we're just going to go around with this and we're just going to go over the um, the obvious blemishes now she wasn't wearing any earrings so we're going to delete the uh, the holes there and um, I'm just going to smoothen out this transition here um, just by going over that and I'm just going to have a look at that from back here um, it looks a little bit looks a little bit obvious that I think so we're going to undo that and I'm going to put it up on its own layer we're going to do it again and then we can back it off and I should really have put it on its own layer I don't know why I bother because it's mainly for um, spot healing purposes this really isn't necessary I've just done a little thing there haven't I so the healing brush is quite good at retaining texture itself um, and then we're going to dial that back a little bit I don't want it probably about 80% something like that I'm going to blend that in and then make another copy um, and we're going to go over here and do the same that's it now I don't want to get too close to those eyelash shadows because I really like those um, again we're going to back, do that one at about 90% I think make ourselves another copy and we're going to go and just do these and add some little hairs here which we're going to do so we're going to make the brush smaller a bit further away i'm going to go down here now this video is going to be completely unedited so you get to watch me make all kinds of mistakes and you know swear at photoshop um, Now, when you you can hear me clunking away, I'm holding the Alt key to um, resample um, because I want to make sure that I'm getting like um, texture. Really, uh, it's the most thing. Reddit. What on earth is that about? Right, a little bit bigger. Uh, now, this is a soft brush, so although you know I'm making the thing quite big, it's. Um, and I've got a sort of pressure sensitive tablet here. I'm only using really the, the very center of it. Um, so it's nice that it, it just kind of blends in. I mean, you could pretty much do these and get away without any of this retouching, to be honest. They'd still be perfectly usable, these shots. Um, as you could see back in Lightroom, the picture was sort of okay. But for a portfolio image, um, one that I might print really, really big. Uh, I'm going to go to this trouble now. We've shot these at f2, f2.2, something like that. So the depth of field is really shallow. You know, you can see that even her ears and everything is starting to go out of focus, even to the back of the cheek here. So that means that we haven't really got a lot to do in in post uh, in terms of cleanup. We can get away with things on the arms that you know they're just not in focus anyway. So there's a little few things here, but. It's um, it's a relatively quick job. Don't forget, um, you know, to have a look around the uh, clothes as well, for bits of fluff or damage that you need to heal. Um, the idea is we're going to get all of that done fairly quickly. Now you may have noticed there's a big line of sort of um, chroma here. So it's ferrochromatism or chromatic, an, a chromatic aberration of some sort, um, which is a, a property of um, using this sort of really hard light. Um, I don't mind it, okay? You can take it off in Lightroom. Um, the profile one doesn't tend to do it. You have to do it manually using the manual sliders, but it's fairly easy to do. But I really like that it tends to be what, it's part of the magic, I think, um, that lends these images um, the look that they have. So when you're near an edge like that, just make sure you line the edge up, otherwise you go and get smudging on the healing tool. Um, the clone tool sometimes does a better job on that. Right, okay, we're, we're getting to the um, the end of the cleanup, I think. There's a law of diminishing returns here. 
um, well, you know, you can zoom in and carry on working on this down to ridiculous amounts. Um, but I'm not going to do that. A lot of the broader uh, problems with the tone are going to be sorted out in the next stage. But before we do that, we need to establish our frequency separation layers. Uh, now, I'm not going to tell you how to do this. There's tons of tutorials and actions and things you can download. I have an action. Um, I can't remember, to be honest, whether I recorded this myself or whether I got it from somewhere else. Um, but the, the, the idea behind it is more important, okay? And the idea behind um, using frequency separation. Now, people will often say, oh, you've used frequency separation on the skin. Well, that's not really true, right? Um, it's a bit like saying you've used Photoshop. Um, because there's a number of different things you can do within a frequency separation construct. The frequency separation framework that you establish on uh, basically two layers is really to protect either the tones from the texture modifications or the texture from the tone modification. It's not a technique for smoothing or fixing skin in itself, right? You can't just set up frequency separation and go, ta-da, it's done. Um, you still have to then use the various tools as you normally would, but within those layers, you are protected from um, messing other things up, uh, you know, unwanted side effects effectively. So frequency separation is not a skin smoothing technique, right? And I see this all the time in magazines and on websites, people talk about uh, how to, you know, using skin frequency separation to smooth skin. Now that's not what you're doing. You're using the healing brush or the clone stamp or the, or the, some Gaussian blur or, or a brush uh, to actually do the skin smoothing, but you're going to do it on a frequency separation construct, right? And we're going to set that up here. And the, the, the basic idea is that you need to, when you're setting this up, one of the layers gets blurred as part of the process, okay? Um, and the idea is that everything that is blurred at this point will be preserved as texture, okay? And everything that you can still see will be on the low frequency layer. So I can still see just a tiny bit of texture there. I'm going to increase that to nine pixels. I think that's going to give us what we want. Um, I don't want all the texture, but I want that fine uh, detail. So now I can't see any of the pores. Um, and you can see that, you know, there's all the skin detail which we want to keep. Um, so that is all nicely blurred away. So we're going to OK that. And now, um, through uh, it uses apply image and some maths to combine. And when they're combined together, it doesn't look any different uh, than the original image. And we can in fact toggle on and off the layer for frequency separation to see it makes no difference. Now, all of the work that we're going to do today is going to be on the low frequency layer. It's very rare that I have to actually fix things here on the high frequency. It is very useful. Uh, for really serious uh, skin problems um, when you've got, you know, um, lots of wrinkles and skin that you need to, to take away. Some poses, especially when you're doing fitness shoots or some nudes and things like that, when they're bunched up, you can get a lot of, you know, and it is useful for that. But today, nothing like that exists on this image. We, we don't have to um, do any of that. It's just really going to be evening out the tones to get that kind of um, small, smooth porcelain look that we want in these type of shots. Now, um, back in the day, um, obviously before Photoshop, back in the 30s and 40s, when people like Bert Six and George Harrell um, were doing these things, the assistants would scrub the negatives um, on the skin to get that smooth look. Um, so I believe that they didn't do any post back then. Oh, they did. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff went on. In fact, a lot of these tools here, the icons represent what they would have used in the dark room um, to, to do that, like this, these sort of little dodge and burn things, the lollipop thing there. But we have a we have Photoshop to do it now. So the first thing I do is I'm just going to blend the tones together just by blurring uh, sections of the um, low frequency layer. So we're going to select bits we want to even out. Uh, now we don't want the eyes. We don't want the eyelashes, but I don't need to be too clever about this because I'm going to mask off the, the whole effect, the whole set of layers 
uh, from all of this, so any of this stuff. But it does um, tend to bleed in to your blur layer if you have um, massively different colors around the edges. Oops, put that back. So I'm holding the shift. So I'm holding the shift to add to the selection. And I'm using the Alt key to take away from the selection. In fact, you know what? I'm just going to put that bit back in because we'll mask that off the, um, the actual eyelash shadow um, to a certain extent. Okay, so then um, we're just going to blur it. Now I have Gaussian blur, a band on key on my tablet, and I'm going to blur it um, just slightly more than the um, separation blur value. Okay, so there we've done that. Um, and we can have a look and see what we've done. And um, you know, it's 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 not um, it's not a massive amount. Okay. Now the the main area here is going to be the forehead. And I have a button on my tablet, bound to Control F, which is going to blend that in even more. Okay. Now I think this may be a little bit heavy-handed. Um, and in fact, I might just go back a few actions. A uh, few uh, steps, sorry. Um, so I'm going to go to that one. And I think we're going to do that blur again. Um, I'm going to use a slightly lower value, I think. I think we're going to go for 9. Exactly the same as, as the uh, separation value. I think that's probably better. We'll do it one more time. So 2 lots of 9 rather, rather than 11 is going to give us a better result, I think. The higher the blur value is at this point, the flatter the tones are going to be. Um, and I don't really want them that flat. Now I'm going to come back to the forehead in a little while um, using the mixer brush, but I'll explain about that um, at the time. But just going around these uh, more obvious uh, areas where they should be the same tone and they're not. I don't want to um, do um, too much blurring when I don't, when I don't have to. All right, so we're just going to reduce that highlight on the nose there. All right, so don't forget the rest. So even though it's blurred, it will still benefit from some evening out of the tones. And I am going to use a big, bigger value on this one. Uh, and just do that a few times. That's going to nicely blur, blend together all of the colors and tones on there. There we go. And we'll just do it. Very loose selection around here. There we go. And I'll just loosely deselect the uh, necklace. Just a couple of spots on that. And we're, we're almost done. Let's have a quick check on uh, where we are. Now we're going to mask this off in a second. So some of those uh, edge sharpness that we've lost will come back. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I'm just going to duplicate that low frequency layer because this off very often messes up uh, and I'm going to get the mixer brush, which is the wet brush, but I have it set to no paint. Okay, so the brush is not being loaded. Um, all these things are roughly on 30 apart from the flow, which is 5, and it's got no, so whatever's in here doesn't matter because it's not going to be applied to the brush. It's literally just going to use the colours and tones that are in the image already. And blend those together so I'm going to make it quite big and I can just go across that um, and just locally blend um, some of these things together and um, just go across the forehead like so just blend those in uh, you just want to go across uh, the area of the direction of blend and um, even though I'm going across the hair with this it's not smearing the hair because they're the hair is on the um, high frequency layer now. You see, I've, uh, while I've been yammering away at you, I've kind of messed that up a little bit. Uh, and we're just going to just going to straighten up the um, nose highlight there. There we go. Just paint that in. And you are sort of painting here, really. You're just, you know, you're literally painting away. And we can straighten up the. Um, I don't, don't like that at all. Just undo. Um, but that's pretty much it. We don't need to do a lot to this. And we can just um, just see what we've done on that layer. And 
anywhere where we think, okay, well, I've gone a bit too far. In fact, I think I might have I've altered the shape of the forehead there. So this means I can start again, um, or sometimes I'll mask off the bits that I don't want from a particular go. Um, but I quite like this dark area here. I think that needs to stay. So rather than go backwards and forwards, I'm just going to go from left to right. So I'm picking the brush up uh, just to blend that in. And then I'm going to extend the, the pale a bit over a bit there. And go up and down rather than left and right. There we go. So we retain some of that. And I think I went a little bit overboard on the um, nose there. So that's more like it. There we go. Just going to blend that together a little bit. Okay, there we go. Just do that little highlight there. Go up and down on the arms a little bit makes those look a little bit straighter uh, and there we go right now we're going to put a mask on the whole thing switch to a brush make sure the brush is a, a round soft brush which it isn't at the moment it's my, well, it's my sparkly thing which um, we'll come back to at the end so just got a nice round soft brush 100% uh, opacity and flow black and we're going to zoom in a little bit and we're just going to take this around the edges um, to get the detail back. I'm going to go over the eyes, over the eyebrows, over that uh, little shadow there, right into the corner. There, go around the edges of all the shadows and nice little sort of creases and face features that we want to keep. We want to keep sharp so. I want to get that chin edge back again, the jawline back, make sure that's all in. Now because the changes that we've done on just blending the, um, the tones are quite subtle anyway, um, where we mask it off isn't immediately obvious. You know, the bigger the change you do, the more obvious it's going to be where the edge of it is. Uh, so just go around all the edges um, go around all of this, even though we kind of deselected this, just going to make sure that it's all in. So we're going to go around the edges of any shadows, bones, that kind of thing. Edges of nice shadows that we want. You know, it's the whole point of this look is uh, the hard shadows, so we don't want to destroy those. So we're going to mask that off. Um, switch to white and try and just put it back on the. Um, upper eyelid there. Make sure that's smoothed out and right up to the edges with a small brush. We'll put that back in there. There we go. Okay. Then we can zoom out 100%. And that's what we've done in terms of the cleanup. Now, so I'm going to flatten this. I, I don't keep all the layers, right? I know serious Photoshop people who have like, you know, hundreds of layers up there. Um, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, my machine, although it's like a eight core, i7, eight virtual cores, uh, 24 gig of RAM, um, four gig of video RAM, you know, GeForce, GTX, 1050 or whatever it is, uh, one terabyte um, SSD for the working drive, it still slows down, right? I mean, it still runs like an asthmatic donkey with three legs after a while in Photoshop. And the other reason is that if I left all those layers there, I'd just come back and tinker with them again and again and again, and I'd never get the image finished. So I have to kind of like commit, right? <laughs> commit <laughs> the changes, move on, move on to the next thing, which is red stuff. Okay, so um, we've got a bit of redness in the eyes um, with our model here. Um, and uh, the first thing I'm going to do is use the spot healing brush, uh, not the regular healing brush, but the little content aware spot healing brush. Make sure it's content aware there. And uh, I'm just going to go over these little blood vessels in the eyes here. Oops, now 
the results you get using contact wear stuff can sometimes be a bit random they're less predictable than the sort of healing and clony type things um, but on the whole this works okay as long as you don't get too close to other stuff which it may decide needs to be in the frame and there we go at that little thing there as well right okay that's that's probably about as far as i can go with that um, so we're now going to use um, hue saturation layer instead and the rest of the general redness uh, so we're going to go to the uh, red channel we're going to desaturate it uh, maybe increase the, the lightness a little bit and then of course we don't want that on the whole image so we're going to uh, invert that mask and get our brush white um, get our brush Photoshop is so weird sometimes um, and it's white 100% and we're just going to paint that in uh, just over these bits okay because the, the redness here we, we need that I mean that's you know that's part of being human um, I'm also going to increase the hue a little bit, which is going to get rid of um, some of that sort of magenta -y type stuff. And we're maybe going to just, it's more magenta perhaps than reds. So I'm just going to move the color selector a little about a bit. Um, and then we're going to look at the sort of the effect that we're having. I think in the corner there, it kind of needs masking off. Um, so I'm going to go back to the brush, black, and just take it off that, that corner there. I don't want that. Um, nobody wants sort of um, blue, blue bits in their eye whites. So in fact, we could probably put the, we can probably afford to put the, the saturation up and just, just use the hue more than anything, just to sort of move those, um, shift those colors um, away from the red and we can see there there we go that's quite subtle um, I'm going to come back to the eyes and do a little bit more work on those in a minute but while, while we're still on the subject of the reds there's a little bit of redness um, on the skin uh, people tend to get red here um, on their elbows knees hands um, and obviously they also get red in the cheeks but we want to keep that and there's also the ear here uh, because the light is shining through it we get a lot of red there and we can we can uh, lessen that um, by doing this so we're going to get another hue saturation layer um, but this time we're going to be absolutely picky about um, what hues we're going to affect so to set that up we're going to dial it all the way to one side i usually go to the left and uh, we can now see where we're going to be affecting the image and just to make sure that we've got the selection absolutely right, I'm just going to take the feather off the selection for the colours and then move it about. And what we're looking for is the bits that I know are likely to be more red in the skin. And it's kind of there. Um, and I want it not completely selected. And then I'm going to uh, drag out the feather. Now it's going to start increasing. Um, in fact, I'm going to knock this back a little bit so that I can feather it in a little bit more. These uh, little controls are quite hard to get hold of sometimes. Um, and that's pretty much it. Now, um, so we're now going to do the actual adjustment. Um, and I'm, usually it ends up being around plus eight, something like that. But of course, it's also affected other areas that we, we don't want. But before we um, get into masking it off let's just figure out what it's doing is it doing the right thing yes i think so i think that's pretty cool actually um we're just going to knock up the um saturation a bit because it tends to make it a bit gray and um it tends to also darken it a little bit so but we need don't put the lightness up as much as the saturation because lightness also destroys saturation um so if i do that there's no color all right so um Always make sure you've got a little bit more saturation, usually about double. And um, now we can take those off and you can see the effect that's having. 
Right, um, but obviously we don't want that on um, everything, so we are going to uh, use a black brush and we're going to take it off the bits that we know um, we don't want it on. So switch over to brush, we need a bit bigger of a brush, 100%, and uh, for definite we didn't want it on the lips, um, probably not on the eyes either. We want it on the ear, so if I take it off the ear there you can see um, we definitely want it on the ear. Um, we don't want it on the cheeks though, um, so we can't like that. It's good on the chin. Um, let's see what it's, it hasn't done anything to the dress really, so that's okay. Um, it's out of range. So now we're toggling it on and off and seeing if there's any other areas that we need to mask it off from, and I think it's good to go. Uh, in fact, I might just increase it to nine. Um, and now we've got nice, even skin color. And do this after you've done the frequency separation, by the way. It tends to work better for whatever reason um, when you've blended everything. There we go. So I'm looking at the sort of um, decolletage, this upper chest area here. And that has now evened out. So it's subtle, but it makes a lot of difference. Not particularly in this image. If you're doing like three quarter full length and you've got knees and elbows and things like that, especially if, you know, models, some, you know, especially white people tend to have a lot of, um, you can get blotchiness, especially on the legs. And this can be quite useful for sorting that out. So I hope that you found that useful. I find it a very useful tool is uh, modifying the hue of um, reds. Sometimes you get the opposite, you get a bit of green uh, on, on certain areas of the skin. On the soles of feet and things like that, it's very rarely that I have the soles of a foot. A sole of a foot in my shot, but if you've got those, you can do the opposite. You can select the greens and bring them back towards the red a little bit. But anyway, we're going to move on. Uh, so we'll commit that. Okay. And uh, the next thing we're going to do a little bit more work on the eyes. Um, is I want them to be a bit brighter. Now there are various methods. I've seen people like use a screen layer and paint it in up to the corners and things like that. It makes the eyes look very flat. But eyes are spherical, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're big. I mean, they're inside your skull um, and they have shadows in the corners. So, you know, we, we, we have to be sympathetic to, um, to retaining that shape. So I'm going to just um, have the, um, the curve go th at a diagonal through this kind of uh, area here and look at it uh, on the screen. And, um, but we don't want it to affect the shadows too much. Uh, we'll just make sure we've got no steps in it, although at this end um, the eyes are not in that zone really, so uh, we'll, we'll be okay with that. Now obviously we don't want that on the whole image, so again we're going to um, put a black mask on it, and for this we're just going to get a white brush, soft brush, um, and we're just going to dab twice uh, in the centre of the eye. Now. Um, it has of course gone over the skin, so we're going to switch to black, make the brush a lot smaller, it's still soft, and we're just going to go around there and take that any unwanted uh, brightening off the skin. Although I do quite like it sometimes on the um, the makeup on the on the eyelid, that can look quite good. Um, but we generally want to just delete it. There we go. Okay, now um, we're also going to do some color adjustments in that same zone. So we're going to get another hue saturation layer and we're just going to pin it to wherever this one was brushed. So it's going to affect the same area. Uh, and again, uh, we're going to just play around with the hue here. Um, but for the whole lot, I don't think that's really something we want to do, but we're going to go back to the reds and we're just going to, again, knock some of that magenta out of it, like that, and take some of the saturation out. So there, so as you can see what it actually, what we're actually playing with. Um, and so we're taking it down in the opposite direction and playing with the lightness. Um, and again, we can look at the, uh, the overall effect possibly a little bit strong. Um, in fact, when you zoom out, you can see it, it is a little bit too strong. Um, so 
but I want to keep the color things constant. So rather than adjust the overall opacity of the thing, I'm just going to reduce the curve a little bit. Okay. So we'll come back to this. We can see that we've now brightened those in quite a subtle sort of way. All right. Let's commit all of that. We're going to flatten that. Bong. Now, before I forget, uh, we're also going to have a look around for stray hairs. We're going to go to the spot healing brush again, the contents of our spot healing brush, um, because we've got a gradient in the background here, and this is really good at preserving that. Um, now, I like, in fact, I need these flyaways. Right? That's what's producing this glow. So I'm only going to delete any that are sort of really, really sticking out in an obvious sort of way. And sometimes you need to go over this a couple of times um, just to get it absolutely right. Um, and we're just going to have a look around for anything which is just really, really obvious. And just knock them back a little bit. But don't get tempted to, you know, do too much of that because you'll end up doing a lot um, and it'll be very frustrating and um, uh, it's just not very um, the end result will never be particularly satisfactory um, and you'll end up destroying that nice light now uh, I'm looking at this here and thinking hmm um, I want to again reduce that a little bit so i'm going to go back to the reds and i'm going to go and make sure that we've got that selected there we go just there and you can see it hasn't selected any of the background which is really really nice um so we're going to go that way a little bit and we're going to desaturate and we're going to darken uh, just a little bit as well in fact, we'll bring the saturation back up, but we're going to darken. Um, and you can see that that's had a nice, nice effect on that here. Now, obviously, we don't want it on the rest of the image, so we're going to take that off. And uh, we're going to use a white brush. And we're just going to go over that. Oh, that's not the white brush. That's why that's not working. I'm trying to spot heal the uh, mask. Uh, switch to a, a, a white brush and go over that there. Now we can see it has affected uh, some of the skin colour. Um, so what I'm going to do is we'll put that right over there. And we're going to bring that in. Oh. But we might not be able to separate those colours out. They might be... Um, we'll have a go. Let's put that right together and see. We need to get where the difference is between the skin colour and the um, Just there, I think. And bring that the other way. Okay. And we'll just clip a um, so we'll just clip a here uh, a curves adjustment layer onto that and um, We'll need to do a bit more masking just to sort of bring that down just a little bit. Okay. Let's get mask again. Brush. Black. Let's go around there and um, see what effect overall that's had. It has darkened it a little bit. Um, just going to finesse this. Um, curve a little bit. It's really only the lighter bits that we need to take off. Um, you could use these hand tools and things, but I tend not to. I tend to just move this around until it looks good. Um, so I can see that's affecting the skin. And it's probably at about there. That's way out of range. It's about there. There we go. A little bit more. 
you see as I pull that down it pulls the other bit down here up which is actually uh, not something you really want to do so you need to bring it down to match oops definitely don't want that down to follow and create the curve and just bring it back into line in the shadows there we go right that's a little less obvious that'll do commit flattens the image now um, I've got some nice sparkles down here on the um, uh, necklace so we are going to uh, do some funky stuff now I mean all, all of this stuff is kind of optional right I mean you don't need to do this um, but uh, I quite like it um, so we've got a a little sort of lens flary brush thing we're going to make it nice and small uh, we're on 100% opacity we're on a separate layer and we're just going to find some existing um, sparkles some little light points and just dab over them um, and try and match the size a little bit there's a tiny one there okay right and try and arrange them in some sort of pleasing combination and uh, they don't have to be exactly where they're meant to be but um, you know try to arrange them fairly evenly and we're going to make another layer uh, in fact, before we do that, we're going to set that to screen. We're going to set this one to screen as well, and with a different brush. We're now going to use this one. And um, I don't know, search the internet for um, lens flare brushes. You'll find these things. I, I really can't remember where I got them from. Um, now, that's way too big. Um, these brushes can be deceptive sometimes in size. Um, that's, again, way too big. Should be even smaller. This one's quite big. That one's smaller. Okay. And that's about that's the same for our that's done for our sparkles. Uh, I'm gonna put them in a group and then I'm gonna reduce the opacity um, just so that they're just subtle, right? Uh, there we go. Now, we're going to do a bit of work on the lips um, and on the teeth, I think. I might do the teeth first, actually. Um, this is the first image for a long time that I've done and retouched teeth. And um, we're going to do a similar thing that we did for the, um, the eyes. Uh, and that uh, we need to create a gradient uh, for the brightening. We're not just going to use, um, you know, we're not just going to set it to screen and wipe it on. It just looks a bit ridiculous, that. Uh, and we're just going to manually paint this so um, I'm just going to invert that um, zoom in and we're going to get the brush we're going to put the brush back to something sensible um, and one of these days I will rearrange this brush collection you can see there's a little thing there on that tooth but we'll, we'll take that out in a minute now I'm going to little I'm going to Increase the hardness on this just by two taps um, and we're going to go to white 100% and we're just going to paint um, on here uh, that's going to paint them more carefully on here um, now it's generally easier to paint around um, convex corners right so I'm being very careful of the gums because I can't get in there with a the brush um, but I can brush it off the lips quite easily, okay? Um, so I don't mind it going on there. And in fact, I have to, to try and sort of get it that straight edge uh, on there. Um, now where the teeth overlap, I don't really need to bother going up to the edge. I can just go over that. Um, again, we'll, we'll get in there. Uh, 
this one. If I do quick portraits in Lightroom, um, I use the auto mask um, function on Lightroom's adjustment brush to just swipe over the teeth and it just does a fantastic job. Um, I don't think I'm going to do the back teeth, the, the bottom teeth, sorry. Uh, they're not prominent in the frame. And um, I just don't think we need to. I just think it can end up looking a bit false when the teeth are glowing in the background. So now we can just switch to black um, and just take that off the lips quite easily just by nicely brushing in one stroke across there, across there, and across there. Now, we're then going to back off in a normal way because we're going to look at this full screen. I'm going to look at that and obviously it's just way too, um, I think we're going to boost the shadows a little bit and then bring the whole thing back. And the other thing we're going to do to this is we're going to clip the hue saturation layer and we're going to go to the yellows and we're going to knock the saturation out of the yellows. Okay. Um, which has dulled them a little bit. So we'll go back to our curve. Just bring up the highlights, just the very highlight areas. There we go. And Photoshop nicely draws this little histogram of what's in the selection. Okay, so that's just the teeth. So I can see that this actually is the brightest area of the teeth um, right there. Uh, and I kind of want to create a gradient through that zone just there, okay? Um, but ultimately you need to be guided by um, what you can see on the screen. So do keep an eye on that. And, um, you know, histograms are all very well, but it's really there as a, as a technical guide. It's not, you shouldn't be a slave to it. Um, so we've kind of dialed that back a little bit, and I think that's about right. That's where I'm gonna leave that. Um, I'm going to flatten the image um, because I do that. Um, and now we're going to work on the lips. So um, we're going to put the lips up on their own layer and we're going to set that to uh, multiply because we're going to work on the color. Um, but obviously we need to be a bit more accurate with where this is and we will get rid of that thing on the tooth in a minute. Um, so, but not on this layer. So we're going to put a mask on it, black mask, hold alt, click the mask button and now again I'm just going to paint this in so I'm going to get the brush um, and again I'm going to concentrate on the inside edge so I don't really care if it goes over the outside so I'm going to put that on white and I'm going to just get brushing across here, lift the pen every now and again to create a new history step uh, so that you can undo so it's kind of like your lifeline in, um, not your lifeline, your, uh, what do they call it in uh, Millionaire? Where they set a value. So it creates you a thing you can fall back on. Okay, I think that's good. Now on this, this area of the lip is kind of big enough for me to be able to get up to the outer edge as well without making the brush smaller. I, I'm not making the brush too much smaller, by the way, because it, it's going to sharpen the edge uh, more than I want. Um, now we've, we've got all the lip in there. That's great. Uh, so now we'll switch to our black brush and take this off again. Off the top, and we've released a bit there. So anywhere where it's gone over the... Uh, skin come around there now just need to check really where the edge is here so I'm going to reduce the opacity so I can actually see where I should be brushing I couldn't actually see that oops and just around this area as well there we go right so I'm put the opacity back up and once again we're going to clip um, a hue saturation layer to this 
and we're going to increase the saturation, which also brightens a little bit. And we're going to increase the lightness just a touch as well. And have a look at that. Um, we're going to mask it off or use the blend if sliders to prevent it from affecting the highlights because I want to preserve the highlights. So I'm just going to move that slider across there and you can see the highlights come back. Now I just want the actual specular highlights, not the kind of lighter areas of the lip. So I'm going to do it until I start to see that brighten and then back it off a bit. And you can see preview, you've now brought back that nice highlight. Um, but that's way too much. Um, there's a number of things we can do here. We can just adjust the uh, opacity, which is probably what I'm going to go for. The other way to do it is on the hue saturation, you can adjust the lightness. Uh, and that has a very similar effect. Um, you know, or we can go dark. Um, so if you want really dark red lips, so that's, that's the one way of doing that. Um, you can increase the uh, saturation, um, which also lightens it, and then bring back the darkness. Um, but in this case, I think we're, we're going to go for, I quite like that, and then we're just going to use the opacity, I think, really, to um, take off the whole um, layer there. I'm going to go for something like about 17. Always check what you've done. Now you have the potential here to ruin the mood of the image and I don't want to do it too much. So I am going to go for about, let's see, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, what are we going to end up? I think we're going to end up on about 50, 53 maybe. Yeah, maybe a little bit less, 45. A little bit more, we're homing in, binary chop. I'm going to go for 47. Oh, that looks good. Okay, maybe just a little bit less. Change my mind. 45, okay. Right. Okay, image, layer, flatten image. Uh, that's that gone. Now let's have a look. Let's quickly just get rid of that little doodad on the tooth. Not that we can really see it at any sensible um, level of zoom, but I'll just grab a bit of tooth muck there and put it over that. And there's another one there while we're here. I mean, chances of anyone ever seeing any of this is almost nil. Um, but while we're here, we'll just go over some of these. There we go. And um, Rain's got really good lips. She's not um, she's not got cracked lips or anything. The makeup has held up really well. Um, so uh, Mel used a liquid um, lip gloss, gloss lip covering for this, uh, all in one go. It's just a one coat job. Um, it's worked really well. Um, a lot of the time you get, you know, they've got a little bit of it here. It kind of tends to come off the um, um, the inner lip area and we can you know just crudely because we're because we're here and we've got this tool I'm using it um, but there are there are other ways you could paint color on and just blend it with the color mode um, but we'll just repair that you sometimes get some of the um, the lipstick wears off the kind of inner bits of the lip as they kind of you know open close the mouth right um, we might need just a little bit more shine uh, on various places and I'm just going to use um, a screen blending mode with this and we're just going to um, dial it off the uh, non highlighty areas so I'm looking at the eye catch lights and also the um, uh, highlights on the lips as well um, so that's going to work for me I'm going to mask it off and then we're just going to brush it back on those areas. So white brush, 100% soft. I'm just going to go over those bits where we want those highlights to be a bit more prominent. Now I think that's overdone all over, um, which is lucky because I can dial it back in one go. If I wanted it brighter on, say, the eyes or the lips than some other feature, then I would redo them with different opacities or use different layers. Um, but we're uh, just crudely just going to do that like that for now. Yeah, and that's just made those little highlights more prominent. Now we're going to put a bit of a glow on here. Um, 
And I used to do this using a thing called um, Color Effects, Nick Color Effects Pro that was bought by Google and then they sold it to somebody else. Um, but I knew it was going to stop working at some point. I, I, I don't know whether it still works. To be honest, I haven't used it in a long time. But the last feature that I was using in it was a thing called Glamour Glow, which produced that lovely glow that you used to see on those, those old images. Uh, and they used to use a variety of things to use those from like gauze or tights or something like that over the lens or the, or the lights, smearing stuff over you know, bits of glass to hold in front of the lens and things like that. But we don't need to do that now. We can just get a, a, you know, a good capture and then work on it in post. So for this, um, we're going to duplicate the layer and we're going to image, um, apply image, and um, we're going to merge them together with these settings. So um, the layer is merged. It's the whole uh, thing. Um, not inverted, channels, all, all the color channels. And we're going to use the blend mode of multiply at 100%. Okay, and these two things are clicked off, so we don't need to bother with that. And that's going to produce that layer, and then we're going to blend that. Now you can see that we've got all the um, shadows have been reduced dra drastically on this layer, right? So I'm going to blend it with screen, so that's going to mean that they're not going to really affect it at all. Um, and then we're going to come to this layer and we're going to blur it. Now, as a rule of thumb, you want to blur it about one pixel of blur for every megapixel of image resolution. So this one was shot on a D850, which is about 45 megapixels. So I'm going to start off with that. Um, but obviously we don't want it that strong. And then we're going to back it off on the opacity slider. And I normally end up somewhere between 20 to 35. I think we'll try about 30 for this. And that's produced quite a nice sort of glow on the image, which I quite like. Now, I probably don't want it on the eyes, so I'm just going to apply a mask, reveal all mask, black brush, bring the softness back on the brush, 100%. So I'm just going to take it off that eye detail there, because I really want that sharp. Okay, and then we can toggle that on and off. That seems to have worked okay. Now, um, final adjustments. We're just going to play around with the curves adjustment. Um, just see what we can get, really. Uh, so we're going to anchor it down there. In fact, let's get rid of that and just play around with just one point. Um, You can get there's multiple different looks in there, you know. You could get, um, you know, there's dramatic looks like that, or we can kind of go for a, a nice in your face, glowy sort of look. Um, I'm feeling we don't need to go too far from where it is now, really. I think we might, we might start off, we might end up just doing a traditional sort of contrast S curve. I don't want to go too wild with the uh, the highlights either. And bear in mind, most of the pixels are kind of over here. Um, so we need to do a lot of our work in this sort of area, these four squares here. Maybe just I don't want to drop the highlights too much because you get that. Um, you know, when, when your highlights start to be darker than your shadows, you've, you've done it wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, Look at the image. Um, yeah, I think maybe we try and anchor the um, the mid tones. I think that looks okay. I don't want quite that much of it. Um, I'm going to end up down at forty something. I think. Yes. There we go. Right. Okay. Um, I think we're done. Um, so that's that's pretty much it um, for this image. Um, I don't think this is as killer an image as some of the other ones I retouched in this series, but I've used exactly the same techniques. 
right? It is just basic cleanup. Um, it's getting rid of distracting elements like redness on the skin, skin blemishes, um, and getting more of what's good about the image, like the deep red colour on the lips, um, the, the sparkle in the eyes, uh, the sparkle on the jewellery, uh, that kind of stuff. So uh, we're going to commit that curves layer. Um, and I might just, we'll just do a bit of selective sharpening, I think, before we um, save this file. So um, I seem to have managed to assign that weird and wacky brush to the sharpening tool as well. So we'll put that back to there. And I have this on about 50% um, soft brush and just go over the, um, the bits that you want to sharpen. It really is that simple. So it's usually face features. And I'm going to do maybe a little bit around there just to increase the specular highlights. Um, those nice shadows, eyelashes, that kind of thing. There we go. Uh, nothing more than that. Um, oh, one other thing, actually. We could just straighten that little bump on the nose. That's been um, talking to me while we've been working on this. So I'll just go in and just, just nudge that across. Okay, and same rules apply. We need to make it as big as the thing that we're straightening. Do little nudges, and then we can look at the preview. And it's just sort of uh, narrowed that um, just a fraction. We'll push it over a little bit. There we go. Maybe not so much. So. There's a nice little tool down here called Reconstruct, which is kind of undo on a slider. So now we can decide how much of that we want. And we're going to knock it back a little bit. There we go. Cool. Right, let's save that. Now in terms of workflow, um, I highly recommend this way of working. There's many ways to do this. I know there's people still using Bridge. Um, I certainly don't. Um, everything for me happens in Lightroom. So I do, all of these problems I see with people on forums, I export for web or save for web or I can't export JPEGs. No, don't use that from Photoshop. I never save a finished file from Photoshop. Um, it's just very, very cumbersome. Um, all of my imports and exports and editing starts right here in Lightroom. So we're back in Lightroom. And um, I'll go over there. I'm getting a bit green now because the outside light is lessening. Um, and my white balance on my webcam is a bit um, off now. But um, I'm all right. I'm not actually ill. <laughs> uh, and we're going to look at uh, the TIFF. When it comes back from Photoshop, it's, it's always a bit, loses a bit of its sort of um, life, I think. Um, and we'll compare it with the other one in a minute. But look at the histogram um, the whites have kind of gone off a little bit um, so we're gonna we're gonna just drag them back not by too much and um, we don't want them to be absolutely white um, which is going to give it that little bit more punch again and we're going to just dial that in now sometimes I let Lightroom guess what the contrast should be so I'll hold the shift key down and double click um, and for the longest time it always used to go negative and now it doesn't um, but I think it's wrong in this case. For this particular style, um, we need to um, lessen the contrast. And we're going to go a little bit too far on this preview because for whatever reason, when Photoshop writes the 8-bit JPEG in sRGB, it tends to naturally add a little bit of contrast um, just by however that maths works, where it has to squash all the information into less uh, space. So I take a bit, of, bit more contrast than I normally would out um, and sometimes a little bit of vibrance on a colour image can work. Um, I'm not really, I'm just a, just a tiny bit, I think, maybe about plus five on this one. Um, and the last thing to do is we're, we're going to make a virtual copy, which is another thing that's great about doing this in Lightroom. Um, and on the virtual copy, we're going to make the black and white because we need a different set of um, adjustments on the black and white. Okay. Uh, we can afford to be a bit more um, aggressive with the white point and uh, we need actual blacks in there and we're maybe 
hopefully get the shadows up a little bit more and actually put less contrast or more co no definitely less contrast in it uh, now we can actually play around with the black and white panel um, put a bit of Knock the whites in the total back a little bit. See what the brightness does. No, we definitely don't want that. And back to the black and whites. Just these, the yellow. See, what, I'm looking at the skin more than anything. Reds, we're going to start affecting other things as well. And if we really needed to do serious adjustments on the color basis, we'd do it back in Photoshop so we could mask it. Um, but it's, there's no harm in just, you know, just wang these sliders about and see what, what they affect and what they do. Um, in fact, I quite like the dress being a little bit darker there, so um, I'm going to have to leave that magenta. So the, the magenta, this sort of purple colour is actually giving us the, uh, the eyes and the sparkle on the jewellery, which is quite nice. And um, when look at the blues there. And they need to be a little bit darker, I feel. Aquas. Yep, they're, they're there as well, so we'll kind of line those up and interpolate those two values. Greens, yeah, there was a kind of a green thing in the corner, wasn't there? It's a little bit of a green haze to it. Um, and the yellows, of course, we're doing that background light because it was turned down. And as I said earlier, those incandescent lights get a bit yellow uh, and a bit orange. Uh, now we can see what we've done with the adjustments. We can see we've kind of just evened it out. I think it's gone a bit too far, um, so we're going to bring those... Um, the skin luminance back a bit. Bring that brightness back up. Put the whites down. Contrast. We'll bring the whites completely off, in fact. Um, nice even tones. Um, and in fact, we can see. Oh, it's not going to work, is it? Because it goes all the way back to the beginning. So we're going to put the history settings to just after we did the black and white conversion and we can see what we've done with that. Now again it doesn't show us this on the miniature so I'm just going to hover over there because I think that to me is more important um, in terms of tones I like looking at this. I'm going to knock the shadows down a bit. And there we have it. The only thing I might do to this is um, a bit of a tint. Now there are presets for this, uh, so you've got like selenium tint, sepia tone, um, split toning, um, soft, flat, um, that kind of thing. Um, but they do other things to the image. It, I mean, that isn't just tinting it, putting that sepia on. Um, you know, it's done other stuff. So what we can do is use the split toning and um, set these to the same thing. Now, even though it shows you both, um, because they're on the same thing, we can't really see them. You can't adjust it on that. You still have to go to and click on each thing. It's really annoying. You can't just move them about on, on each, you know, both of them on the same color selector. Now, we really don't want it that strong. So I'm gonna knock the highlights down to about five and then the um, shadows to just a bit more uh, on about eight and then um, you can see it's just warmed it slightly so that it it kind of looks more neutral to me now than than kind of like orange it was looking a bit blue but I don't think that's a strong black and white if I'm honest um, I think I'm going to go with the color um, for this one um, it almost looks colorized doesn't it um, but you know you've seen what I've done with it um, uh, we can just maybe just try adjusting the, um, just maybe knocking a bit of magenta out of the, uh, the white balance, maybe not quite that much, maybe about minus two. Um, we'll see what that looks like. So that's where it came back from Photoshop and now we've um, kind of got it ready for export. And just so you can see uh, where we started from, let's put them on a side by side compare. I'll go over here. Um, in fact, I can get rid of all the tool panels. 
not on the webcam thing. Let's, there we go. And um, so this is where we started from. And you can see it's a strong image, but I think you'll agree that um, it's certainly for your portfolio, it's worth spending a bit of time in Photoshop to just kind of finish it off. Um, and we've now got um, smooth skin, um, uh, we've deepened the color on the lips, you know, the, the tones are all evened out. We've got rid of these specular highlights so the skin looks more matte. I think this is quite far on into the shoot. So even though she's got matte makeup, she's kind of oiling through a little bit. Um, although uh, Melanie was busy touching her up. Um, this is um, what we're dealing with. Um, right, that's pretty much it then. Uh, I think that's that's us finished for that image. Um, oh, one thing actually, this little bump here is, is annoying me slightly. And this is one of the great things about um, this Photoshop and doing things after in Lightroom is I can actually go back and um, and adjust this and um, it will take effect in both of those copies both the black and white and the color um, I'm just going to even it out first and then increase the brush and push it back so I'm evening out the smaller um, bumps and then pushing the whole lot back to where it was. Okay, there we go. And we can see on the preview, that's what we've done. So we've just okay that. Save it. Okay, that's saved. Go back into Lightroom and you can see that that has taken effect um, on our already adjusted um, TIFF. Um, so that's it. I do all my exports from here. In fact, let's just do one. Um, so this was uh, from a different shoot, but uh, after I've not used the um, color checker passport on this one. Um, so the one I've just got a whole bunch of presets here that do all the different sizes that I need. Wallpaper is a sort of uh, desktop size, uh, so it's size for my desktop, which is 1920 by 1080. I haven't got a hugely high resolution fancy monitor. Um, I'm going to change the uh, folder and I've got all the um, the sizes and, and output settings that I need and uh, I'm going to put the studio logo on this one which is that I have these set up again as presets in here uh, and I highly recommend you do that. Um, I put these on as an advert more than anything but um, also um, as a marker not to stop people seeing my images obviously that's not going to stop them and it's easy to remove uh, in Photoshop logos are very easy to remove in Photoshop these days um, but I know that if they do it they did it deliberately right um, so it's hard for somebody to use the defense oh I didn't know I didn't know it was your copyright and I couldn't steal it um, well you went to the effort of removing the logo so you know um, did nothing go through your mind when you were doing that it's harder to use that defense so it doesn't stop them from stealing it but it kind of makes it a bit obvious that they did it with some sort of intent rather than by accident uh, so we'll export that and uh, we should see the folder appear in a second. There we go. Oh, and I've exported, I've got them both selected, so I've exported the, the raw, um, the, the NEF as well without the adjustments, but that's okay. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, let me get rid of the, uh, the menu. Size that window. Oh, I think the cat has come for a visit. Um, fill the screen and then we can rock it back and forth um, and you can see that you know whilst we've got stealer of pens over there um, one of the things we've got about, about this light is because it's um, it is a hard light at the end of the day and so it does show up every little um, uh, pore and imperfection in the skin especially as it's at such an angle so actually that's a, another benefit of the post-processing uh, to get that kind of smooth skin look, that kind of dreamy look, uh, which is goes nicely with the um, uh, limited depth of field uh, in the shot. So there you go. And you can see there's there's the rest of them. Um, in fact, there's the, the original for that one. Um, and then we retouched it into that. 
I think this is my favourite at the moment though. This really works as black and white. Anyway, thanks for watching. Um, hopefully you found that vaguely useful. Um, obviously this isn't a Photoshop lesson. If you want that, go and watch Pix and Perfect with Unmesh Dinder. He's fantastic and it's all free. Um, God knows how he does it. But um, he's a much better presenter than me and he does these things fantastically. But hopefully that gives you that kind of end-to-end -end look at um, where we started in the studio, what the lights look like, the resulting images, and then what we did in the post pro. So thanks for watching, and maybe there'll be another video sometime. Subscribe if you like. Um, I'm not promising there will be, but you know, if you do want to get notified, subscribe to the channel. Um, see you later. Bye.